Psalm 36 this morning, if you'd like to join me there. Psalm 36. Good to have everybody here this morning. I see so many uh, visiting as well. Just glad to have everybody here. I want to go ahead and tell you as we're getting started um, that Randy and perhaps others have been trying to uh, fix a glitch with this screen. For those of you who've been here in the last several services, periodically it'll just flash to black and then come back in. So he's tried a different cable, bypassing a, a splitter that they have in here, a few different things, and it seemed to do it again this morning if you were getting loaded up. So if it does, that's what's going on. If you see it periodically, just go blank. Uh, it should come back in within a moment. And then this evening we're going to try something else and bypass the connector that's going on. We'll try to whittle down what's going on here. Um, as long as you've got your text open to Psalm 36 and are following along, we should be good to go. Uh, if you're visiting with us here and you're new to your scriptures, the, most of the passages are going to be up on the screen there, so you can read them along with me. Uh, if you have your hands full taking notes, I don't see hands full with little ones today. Uh, but just in case someone all of a sudden has a baby, you'll, you'll be good to go. It'll be up here and you can read along with them. You can edit that out of the final thing that you're supposed to use if you can't. That joke didn't land quite the way I thought it would. It sounded better up here. Um, let's move on to stuff I like. Yeah. One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Psalms. Uh, you may have heard it sometimes referred to as the Psalter. Did it do it already? Yeah. It sure did. All right. Um, the Psalms was the songbook, in many ways, the prayer book of ancient Israel. There's, of course, a certain new extent to which it is our book of songs and prayers also. Uh, many of the thoughts of our hymns are based on concepts drawn from the psalms. Did it do it again? Okay. We uh, sometimes will pray the thoughts of the psalms. You may be able to think of people who, when they say prayers, you just love to hear them pray. Some of my favorite prayers have been those who... Uh, not only could pray the psalms by referencing them throughout their prayers, but they, they did that because the psalms seemed to be so indelibly written within them that they almost couldn't help but pray those thoughts. And I find myself wanting to be like that. I want to be able to pray the thoughts and the statements of the prayers that are recorded for us and preserved uh, by God for us. And maybe that's, that's something that you wish to be able to do better as well. Last week, we consider the request that the disciples make of Jesus when they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And as our way of asking our Master the same thing, we studied his prayers in the New Testament. And one point that we made during that lesson was that Jesus often prayed God's words back to him, meaning he took those words of Scripture and prayed those very words. And those men whose prayers I admire, that's what they do. So how do we get to the point where we're more like those who can have those praises and prayers come to mind so that we can draw upon them and have a, a richer communication with God? Well, I think that is one of the, the benefits and the beauty of studying the book of Psalms and, and reading the Psalms and reading them again and again. We can saturate our hearts with these Psalms and prayers so that when we speak and when we pray, or even when we are discouraged, these words can, can float to the surface and be there for us when we need them. So this morning I'd like for us to study uh, through Psalm 36. The, perhaps the best word for this psalm is that it is a celebration. A celebration of the steadfast love of the Lord. But if you're looking at it, it doesn't start like that, does it? As you start this psalm, you're, you're really not quite sure where it's going. Because it starts with a description of those who are utterly wicked. Now, depending on your version, my version, the English Standard, says transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. Now, you may have a version that says an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. So that's a bit different, right? You either have transgressions almost personified as it speaks to the wicked deep in his heart and then says what we'll read next. Or your version says an oracle within the psalmist's heart 
concerning the transgression of the wicked, and then describes them with that same similar phrase. So ultimately, we're going to arrive at the same place, but that first phrase may read a little bit differently than you see there. Either way, this is someone that, that's wicked to their very core. And the reason they are wicked is from the deepest part of who they are, deep in their heart, they have no fear of God before their eyes. That's who they are deep within. You might be uh, like I am, in that you are an out of sight, out of mind kind of person. I have to keep stuff right in front of me or I will forget it. I, I have to make sure my phone is going to alert me if I'm supposed to do something. If I'm supposed to have lunch with somebody or breakfast with somebody, I will know I'm supposed to do it that night when I go to bed. I will wake up in the morning and not remember it at all. So I've got to have it in my phone so it will go off and tell me. And if it's not right in front of me, I, I, don't, I don't remember it most times. What the psalmist says here is that the wicked has no fear of God before his eyes. So in his vision, there's, there's no sense, there's no reason whatsoever for why he should have any kind of reverence for God himself. He doesn't really even consider that he hasn't considered that he should fear the Lord. It's not on his radar. It's out of sight and out of mind. There's, there's just no reason why he would. And that's the reason for why who he is in the deepest fiber of his being, the psalmist says, is someone who is wicked. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. You may remember in the book of Romans, in Romans 3, Paul talks about just how sinful humanity has become without God. And to make his point, he strings together a list of several Old Testament passages, starting in verse 10 of Romans 3, going on down to verse 18. The last Old Testament passage that he adds to the pile of this description of the depths of depravity that humanity has reached is this one right here. This is the one he concludes with. This is his grand final climactic statement that caps off this description of just how wicked the wicked are. It's this verse right here, that the wicked is wicked deep in his heart. And all because there is, quote, no fear of God before his eyes. Doesn't even think about it. But this wicked person, even though he's wicked to his core, thinks that he can disguise this and keep it from others, keep him from knowing exactly what he's like. Look at verse 2. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out or despised. Of course it can be found out, it will be revealed, but he's flattered himself, he's convinced himself, deluded himself to think nobody will ever really know what I truly am deep inside my heart. He's just got this life of a blind conceit that he's living. So you've got a very dangerous combination. When you are a wicked person who has no fear of God, and you also don't think anybody else will ever know, well then, that leaves you with the delusion that you just have an unlimited capacity to do whatever it is that you want. And that is exactly the kind of person that this psalmist then goes on to describe. So this is a person, the psalmist says, who in everything he says and does is just pure evil. Notice what he says in verse 3. He'll say anything. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. So he will say anything. Because he didn't think anybody's going to catch him in what he's like. And he will do anything, verse 4. He plots trouble while on his bed. This is someone who plans ways to sin while he's resting. Even before he gets out of bed, maybe may be the idea. As soon as his eyes pop open in the morning, he's already thinking, all right, what, what can I do today to, to further my cause? What evil thing can I do to accomplish my goals? Or it might be that when he lays down at night, before he goes to sleep, he's already thinking, what can I get up to tomorrow? Scheming away. So when he's in bed, he's already fomenting a plan for how he can better himself by taking advantage of others. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He's ultimately responsible for all of this. He does not reject evil. So this is a, a, a 
terrible description of what a faithless, wicked person is like. You might wonder, why does this song start out like this? See, imagine if we had a song in our songbook, and the first verse of it was, was like this. You know, oh, the wicked, they're so bad. They're, I mean, what would, how would you, we wouldn't sing a song like that. That might be this kind of song where we omit verse 1, right, in favor of verse 3. But you know, you've got this one who is utterly sinful. Why are we starting out that way? Where are we going with this? So, as I said, this psalm is one that Paul quotes in Romans 3 when he's decrying the sinfulness of man. As it turns out, Romans 3 is a pretty good place to look to kind of help us understand what I think the psalmist is doing here. So in Romans 3, if you want to hold your place there in Psalm 36, over in Romans 3, I want you to notice how the chapter starts. Because Paul starts to address a point in Romans 3 that he's going to deal with further in chapter 9. And namely that point is that Israel is for the most part unbelieving and lost. But God has made a bunch of promises to Israel. So what Paul is addressing is how do we explain this? If, if, if Israel is for the most part lost, because of unbelief, what about all of the promises that God made to them? Has God somehow been unfaithful? So, for example, he'll say in verse 3, What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. So you can see in that passage, one of the ways that, that Paul is highlighting the complete faithfulness and trustworthiness of God is by putting it in contrast to the faithlessness and untrustworthiness of Israel and others. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. In other words, people may be faithless, but even if they all are, down to the very last one, God is faithful. That's what Paul's making a uh, point out here in Romans 3. If you go back to Psalm 36, that seems to be exactly the same sort of contrast the psalmist is working with. The reason he starts off the psalm with this very stark portrait of the wicked and the faithlessness of, of this kind of, 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 of human is sh to show us, by contrast, just how completely faithful God is. So he's going to paint a very stark contrast. And back in Psalm 36, what you see in the next section of the psalm, verses 5 through 9, is a description of just how amazing the steadfast love of God is. So verse 5. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, and your faithfulness to the clouds. Which is to say, there is no limit to God's love and God's faithfulness. Your love and faithfulness, Lord, go as high as we can see. And then in verse 6, your righteousness is like the mountains of God. So again, you think of the highest kind of peak. The mightiest, most magnificent mountain you've ever seen. And that's what God's righteousness and faithfulness is like, the psalmist says. He then says, your judgments are like the great deep. In other words, whatever direction you want to go, as far as the eye can see, if you want to go up into the heavens and the skies, as high as the mountains or as low as the deeps, as far as you can look, as far as you can fathom, that's how far the love and the steadfast faithfulness of God extends. You're never outside of the scope of His steadfast, faithful justice and love. That's the point. It is everywhere you can go. So think of the picture He's painted so far. People can be so sinful that even in the deepest part of their hearts, they are planning and fomenting evil. God, on the other hand, is so faithful that even to the farthest stretches of what you and I can, can imagine, He is there and faithful and loving. I think that's the idea in this psalm. Paul prays a very similar idea over in Ephesians 3. He prays that the Ephesians might have the strength to comprehend and to know. They will wrap their minds around the breadth and length and height and depth the love of Christ that surpasses knowing, really. And that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. So 
So Paul says, I want you to be able to know the love of God, but along with that, I, I want you even to be able to comprehend it. He says, because it's so tremendous, it surpasses knowing. So I, I want God to strengthen you so that you can better understand it. It goes beyond our ability to comprehend, to describe, to really understand. But I want you to know it as best you can, every dimension of God's love. And that limitless nature of the love of God seems to be what the psalmist is speaking to also. It is unfathomable. The greatest expanse you can think of God's love can easily fill, while evil can sometimes fill our hearts. But the psalmist says in contrast to people like that, in contrast to the way we can be people like that, this is the God that you and I need to serve. And so verse 6, he concludes that as a result of the great love of God, notice this, man and beast you save, O Lord. So God's love and his faithfulness are everywhere, and all of creation benefits from his love. His love is everywhere. There's nothing that can escape it. Man and beast you save, O Lord. That's the end of verse 6. Verse 7, how precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. So what the psalmist is doing is he's just furthering that picture of, of God's provision. So he, he takes care of people. He even takes care of the animals and loves them and cares for them. And now you've got this picture of, of, of God's love as this bird who takes her wings and brings her, her chicks under them and wraps them around them to protect them. You may already be thinking of the location in the New Testament, when you get that same kind of, of tender care spoken to by Jesus when he's lamenting the impending fall of Jerusalem. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, those prophets that are sent to, to, to save her from that disaster. They don't want to hear that message. God would rescue them, they reject it. And he says, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? Take care of them. And what the psalmist says here is, is that that protection is for both man and beast, mankind and animals. All of God's creation, all the things he's made, are the recipients of this unending, steadfast, faithful, all-encompassing love of God. Well, what kind of things does God provide? You look at verse 8. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. So, what do you suppose if you're an ancient Israelite and you hear the language of the house and feasting and drinking water and lights, what do you think you would think of? Do you remember that, that these psalms, for the most part, would have been sung by the Israelites when they'd gone up to the temple to worship? When you go up to the temple to worship, think about what you're going to see. <coughs> First of all, you're going to see the mountain of God. You're going to go up to Mount Zion, and when you go up into Mount Zion, and you go into that temple complex itself, you're going to see this, this incredible structure, especially once Solomon's temple's built. You're going to see all throughout the city of Jerusalem, you're going to see the Pool of Siloam, the Guyon Spring, different things like that. You'll see the big um, labor where the priests would wash to be purified. All these things, long story short, are modeled after the Garden of Eden itself. You might remember that garden had a river that had four rivers that sprang off of it. And then, of course, you'd see if you're a priest, you'd go into the temple itself, you'd see the lampstands and the light. And so in a very, very special sense, you'd see the light and the glory of the Lord that filled the temple. And naturally, when you start to think of these things like the house and the light and the water, there's just a lot of things that as an Israelite would, would echo of the grandeur of the temple. The temple itself is a model of what God has provided just all throughout creation, light and water and life. So you've even got a deeper, wider, broader meaning to that as well. I bring all of that up because a lot of the Psalms will reflect on the fact that God has given his creation light and water and life. I'll show you just one of them over in Psalm 104. I want to pick up there right in the middle of it in verse 10. In Psalm 104. 
You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. And the earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen his heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees, the high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the badgers. You get all these references to animals and just creatures everywhere, up in the high mountains and the, the waters that God has provided for all to enjoy. In verse 19, He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens, and man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. Just look at how many things you've made. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. So you've got a much more um, elaborate psalm celebrating the fact that God provides abundantly water and life and provision. All of his creatures. It's the same idea that Psalm 36 is providing for us, just a bit more succinctly. This is the steadfast love of God. And that's why it can be described as being so all-encompassing. All of us benefit, man and beast, from what the Lord has provided. Now, we mentioned what uh, an Old Testament Hebrew would think of when he hears things like uh, rivers and, and, and light and life and things like that. Well, as Christians, there's something else that pops into our mind, I imagine, when we read verses like this. When you read about God providing a river of delights for us to drink from, or about a fountain of life, and in your light do we see light? That sounds like something we know. I want you to look at a couple of passages in the book of John. John 7 holds the first of those. In John 7, Jesus goes to the temple during what was called the Feast of Tabernacles, or Booths. During that Feast of Booths, the Jews had developed a tradition of drawing water and pouring it out in the temple, apparently in connection with uh, the miraculous provision of water during the wilderness waters. During this feast in John 7, when Jesus is in the temple, he says this in verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So for you and I as Christians, when we think about a psalm like Psalm 36, it talks about God providing water for his creatures to enjoy in connection with the temple. Well, what Jesus does is he takes that imagery to a much deeper level. He says that what Jesus provides is, is a true water of life. Whatever he has, he says elsewhere, if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. So when we think about the water and life that God provides, we, we think about what, how he does that now through the Lord. Psalm 36 also said God gives us uh, light. When the next chapter in John 8, it seems also in, in conjunction with another ceremony that would take place there at the temple where they would light certain torches at night. I want you to look at what Jesus says in, in chapter 8, verse 12. This is when he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you're able to see it in the next chapter there, uh, what he does is he heals a blind man who never in his life has been able to see light. He's only seen darkness. 
and Jesus shows him the light. So what the Bible teaches us is what God has provided for Israel, especially in connection with the temple. That's now fulfilled in the ultimate degree by the one who said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And if the temple and, and God's provision in connection with it was that this great testimony to the faithfulness and the steadfast love of God in the Old Testament, what greater proof do you and I have now of the steadfast love and faithfulness of God when we look at everything that's been done for us in Jesus Christ? And the provision that he's given for all of us. So if you want to think of it like this, the first part of the psalm, Psalm 36, is, is the wickedness and the unfaithfulness of, of men. The second part is the righteousness and the faithfulness of God. But then the third part, in verses 10 through 12, is where we call upon God to continue to be faithful with us. So going back to Psalm 36, let's start in verse 10. The psalmist says, Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. So you've got verse 1 in the contrast of those who have no fear of God. In contrast to those in verse 1 who speak wicked things deep in their hearts, you have this request. Please, Lord, be steadfast in love to those who know you, not those who don't fear you, but be steadfast in your love to those who are upright in their hearts, not wicked in their hearts. So please, Lord, continue to be steadfast in your love. And I really don't know of a better way to, to, to bolster your faith and strengthen it when you encounter a struggle in your life than to do exactly what this psalmist does, which is remind yourself and take inventory as he did of all the ways in which God has been faithful. So mankind can be wicked, but Lord, you are faithful to the uttermost. And I need that faithfulness right now. Please continue in it. Sometimes when you're looking at your life through the lens of, of our temporary experiences, faith can be shaken. And we can start to wonder why and, and start to struggle and doubt. But when you step back and you look at this big picture as the psalmist is doing of the constant faithful provision that God has made for all of his creation, you think of all the things that he does, then you can be emboldened in the same way the psalmist was, reminding himself, I know how faithful God is, I know how faithless we can be, but I know how faithful God is. And so God, I call upon you. I implore you to please continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your, upright, or your righteousness to the upright of heart. Remember last week when we talked about how to pray, one of the things we noted that Jesus did was, as one author put it in a book, was pray backwards. And that was instead of starting with Father in heaven, these are the things that I petition you for. And then in Jesus' name, amen, referring to his authority and his power, start with that. Start with the power and the authority of God. Start with who he is. And then bring before his throne your petitions. It does a few things. It, it, it sets the proper perspective for your time of need and also for God's capacity to grant your requests. Heaven. You notice the psalmist does this here, right? Mankind can be wicked and can be unfaithful, but God is faithful to the uttermost. And Lord, I need you to be faithful right now. The next verse, uh, verse 11, may indicate that in his references there in the first four verses to the wicked, faithless people, that he has a reference for doing this that goes beyond just making a contrast between them and God. It may be that he's having to deal with some of those people. He says in verse 11, Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. So it might be that one of the reasons that he starts this psalm with, with just how dark and depraved the wicked and arrogant can be is because, as it turns out, some of those folks are weighing down on him. 
David, who's the author of this psalm, certainly had many situations like that in his life. But because he, he knows that in spite of what those people are like, God is always faithful, he can call upon God to be with him and not let those people have the upper hand over him. And as a matter of fact, the way that this psalm ends is, is just fascinating because David is so sure that God is faithful and God will overcome the wicked. Notice how he phrases things in the last verse. It's as if he can already see their downfall. This is a proleptic way of speaking, as if the future has already happened. So look at verse 12. There the evildoers lie fall. They are thrust down and unable to rise. So he's, he's, oh, he's in the midst of praying to God, please deliver me from this. Please continue in your faithfulness to me. And he ends the psalm with that message of just, just utter confidence in the Lord. There the evildoers lie fall. I've made my request before the Lord who is faithful. He will do it. So he can already see them in their defeat. It's really something, I think, to have him move in one moment from a cry to God to protect him from those who would harm him to this confident assertion that they're as good as overthrown. Why is it that he can be so sure that his request is going to be granted? Well, it's because He's just prayed to a Lord whose steadfast love reaches to the heavens. He's so confident in the faithfulness of God that as far as he's concerned, it's as if those who are going to try and come against him and do him harm have already been overthrown. So it's just a wonderful example of doing some of the things that we talked about last week with our prayers and still trying to work on, on uh, enhancing our communication with God. Remember just how great God is. Remember the kind of God He is. He's a loving God, a steadfast, faithful God who provides for His creation. And if I'll remember that when I go before Him in prayer, then I can have confidence in the requests and the petitions and the pleas that I bring to His throne. So, uh, your mission, should you choose to accept it, I have some homework for you. It's homework I want to do myself. As I said, I like to listen to, to people pray when they, their prayers are filled with the thoughts of the Psalms. And I think a good way to try to fill my own mind with these kinds of thoughts would be to turn to this Psalm deliberately each day this week. And I offer an invitation to you to do the same this week as well. Whenever it's easiest for you, if that's morning, if that's lunchtime, if that's in the evening, if that's on the drive, pull another Bible app and start into play, I invite you to take a moment and carefully, devotedly, read this psalm each day this week. The same way that the psalmist did, you and I have plenty of reasons to be reminded of the faithfulness of God and plenty of reasons to be confident when we call upon him to be faithful to us. Of course, this isn't the only psalm that, that you can read that, that speaks to his faithfulness. But this is the one I'm going to read every day this week, and I invite you to do the same, and then try to firmly implant these, these wonderful thoughts in our minds. I hope it's been encouraging, you, or encouraging to you to think about the greatness of God, and to think about his steadfast love that extends to the heavens and is great like the mountains. You and I can't see farther than it can reach. Which also means there's not a single person here this morning who lies outside of the scope and power of his saving steadfast love. So this morning, we want to offer an invitation to you because there may be somebody who needs to respond to that steadfast love. Man and beast you say, O oh Lord. That's how verse 6 ended. And in a far greater way than the psalmist was even talking about, he does save us all. Far more than just provision of all our earthly needs as he provides for all of creation, as that verse emphasized. Through his Son, who is the light of the world, through His Son who gives us water to drink after which we'll never truly thirst again, He provides for us all the more. And it might be that you need to respond to that steadfast love this morning.
place your faith in Christ and be baptized into him. If you are a child of God, I hope you'll be encouraged by the faithfulness of God because sometimes we can be faithless. But he is always faithful. And if you need to respond to his faithfulness and repent this morning, we would love to pray with you before you. I hope we can help you to be faithful to the Lord as he has been faithful. Let us know. Let's stand. Thank you, Ben, to Jesus for the